So listen, we'll proceed with the next part of this. So if you see the first part of the chapter, what did we deal with? We had too much of technology around me. Yeah. So the first part of the chapter we were dealing with no, we were dealing with current carrying conductors generating magnetic field. Right? That's what we dealt no? Magnetic field due to a state current carrying conductor and a circular current carrying loop. Now, in the second part of the chapter, what we will do is if you already have a magnetic field, right? What is there? If you already have a magnetic field present, what will happen if you move a charged particle in it or you place a current carrying conductor in it. So let's discuss it again. What is happening? First part, current carrying conductor produce the magnetic field. So there is a magnetic field. Okay, Current carrying conductor produce the magnetic field. Now what is happening? Magnetic field is already present. Means it is produced by something else. You take this current carrying conductor and place it in this magnetic field. What is going to happen? So whenever you talk about a current carrying conductor, the first thing that comes to our mind is charged particles in motion, right? So even before we understand what happens to a current carrying conductor, the first point that we need to understand is what is going to happen to a charged particle, right? So that is why if you look at the topic here, if you look at the topic here, it says, force on a moving charge in magnetic field. Okay. So when you draw the magnetic field, right, you can draw it either as a set of parallel lines or set of into marks or set of dots. You can draw it in those space, right? All of them, if they are uniformly spaced, represent uniform magnetic field. So this is a uniform magnetic field that I have considered. Okay. Not necessary. That when I talk about a force on a moving charge in a magnetic field, it needs to be only a uniform magnetic field. But the reason why we have considered uniform magnetic field here is because we will take this concept and mostly apply it only in the case of uniform magnetic field. That is why I drew this. Okay. Now, having said this, if at all I take a charged particle Q and we give a velocity to the particle B where it is making an angle theta with respect to the magnetic field. Then the force is observed to be directly proportional to the charge that is being projected. So it is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charge that is being projected. It is directly proportional to the velocity of the particle. It is directly proportional to the magnetic field intensity. And also, it is directly proportional to the sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. So it is going to be sine theta. So when you combine everything and write, the force value comes out to be QVB sine theta. Right? It comes out to be Q, V, B, sin theta. It is an experimentally derived quantity. You need not worry about how it has come. So F is given as Q into V into B sin theta. And this is going to be the scalar representation. This is going to be the scalar representation. Whereas if I write the same 
force in the vector quantity in the vector form then i need to answer it is dependent on which two vectors it is dependent on the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector if you observe i wrote it as magnitude of velocity into magnitude of magnetic field into sign of the angle between them so what vector operation do we need to apply between them it is the cross product so when you apply the cross product f vector comes out to be equal to q into v vector cross b vector and this force is the magnetic force that is experienced by the charged particle projected into magnetic field so you you put the subscript of b if you put b how do you read it it is magnetic force if you put the subscript e you read it as electrostatic force is the point clear so this is all about the force on a moving charge in a magnetic field okay you can make a note of this Here. Yeah. Shall I proceed? Shall I proceed? So listen. So when we talk about the special cases, if the velocity of the particle is zero, right? So we know that F is equal to Q V B sine theta. So if the velocity of the particle is zero, you are going to substitute it here. What is going to be the force acting on the particle? It is going to be zero. So what force is this? It is the magnetic force. So here, try to understand when a charged particle Q is placed at rest. In the presence of a magnetic field, what will happen to it? The force is zero. Means the particle is still continues to be at rest. There is no force to move it. So it is going to be at rest itself. Okay. Now, The next case is, if theta is equal to 0 or 180, then what is going to be the force? If you observe, F is still going to be equal to QVB sin theta. You put theta is equal to 0 or theta is equal to 180. right? You get sin 0 or sin 180 to be 0. So what is the conclusion we can draw out of this? Here also the magnetic force is zero, meaning if you project a particle right, with velocity v into the magnetic field, in which direction? Either in the direction of magnetic field or in the direction opposite to magnetic field, what is going to happen? The force experienced by the particle will be zero. So can I conclude that the particle is again going to come to rest? It will. This and this are not different particles. These two are different scenarios. Okay, you should not take these two into consideration and say 
net force is zero. So net force is zero means can I conclude that the particles are at rest? The particle stays at rest. You cannot. Because this is a very, very, very common mistake that happens. When force acting on a particle is zero, velocity need not be zero. It is only acceleration that is zero. But acceleration can be zero under two scenarios. What is it? When the velocity is zero or when the velocity is constant. So what is going to happen in this scenario is the particle will still move, but with a uniform velocity. Okay. So force is equal to zero doesn't mean that the particle always needs to be at rest because this is one common mistake that happens in questions based on MCQ. Wherever you see force is zero, you will just go and tick. The, that too, they will give that as a first option. At rest, you will go and tick it. No. You need to ask this question. Okay. So what is happening here? Velocity of the particle is constant. Means when it is going to be constant, it needs to take a path. What is going to be the path taken here? It is going to move in a straight line. So the question can be framed in the reverse also. What they can say is a charged particle is to be projected into a magnetic field and is expected to move in a straight line. So what are we supposed to do? Project it either at an angle, theta is equal to 0 or 180 degree. Okay. So they can frame the question in any way they want. But you need to be clear. Am I clear with this? So this, put it as a table. And this is very, very important. Okay. Can make a note of this. Finished? Okay. Shall I proceed? Yeah. So the next concept that we are going to discuss is Lorentz force. Okay. So we observe that when a charged particle is projected into a magnetic field, it experiences a force of QVB sin theta or it is Q into V vector cross B vector. Okay. Suppose the same charged particle is projected into combined electric and magnetic fields. It is projected into combined electric and magnetic fields. Then the net force experienced by the charged particle will be equal to, can I call it as electrostatic force plus magnetic force? 
So what is going to be the value of electrostatic force it will experience? It will be Q into E vector plus what is going to be the magnetic force it will experience? Q into V vector cross B vector. So this will be Q into E vector plus V vector cross B vector. So are you able to understand here? So it is going to be Q into E vector plus B vector cross B vector. And this force, which is experienced due to the combined system, is what is called as Lorentz force. And the force that we discussed, that is Q into V vector cross B vector, can be called as the Lorentz force of magnetism. So what do you call it as? Lorentz force of magnetism. Is that point clear? So this is all about the Lorentz force. Okay, Make a note of this. It's not only electric field, there is magnetic field also present. Same? Conductor produced for nothing. Electric field or magnetic field or irkrapa, what will happen? Hmm. Adanal, I wrote it as vector quantity. I didn't say they both are in the same direction. Scalar led compare. Shall I proceed? So next concept that we will see is Fleming's left-hand rule. Okay. So if you observe this Fleming's left-hand rule, it is mainly used to find the direction in which the force is experienced by the charged particle. See, we already have a vector support for it. F vector is equal to Q into, you have V vector cross V vector. See, suppose you have velocity vector in a particular direction and magnetic field in a particular direction. Let's say you have I cap and you have J cap. So what is I cross J going to be? I cross J is going to be K cap. So I cross J is K cap. Now, since velocity and magnetic field combined together gave me the cross product of I cross J as K cap, can I conclude that the force experienced by the charged particle is going to be in the direction of K cap? Can I conclude? We should not conclude. We should not conclude. You will be able to see it is in the direction of K cap only if the charge that you considered is positive. So, it will be in the direction of K cap only if the value of Q is greater than 0. Had the value of Q been less than 0, then the answer would have been minus K cap. Are you able to understand this? So, the answer would have been minus K cap. Here. So, this is how the cross product is helping us to validate. This is how the cross product is actually helping us to validate the direction in which the force is experienced. But do we have a rule that can actually help us to find the directions easily? Suppose I say that the magnetic field is like this and velocity is like this and the charged particle projected is positive. Okay. Then we have a rule called as Fleming's left hand rule. It is not called Fleming's left-hand thumb rule or something like that. There is no thumb in it. It's called Fleming's left-hand rule because 
we are going to use three fingers of which hand of the left hand right what are the three fingers the first three fingers thumb four finger and the central finger so all the three fingers we need to stretch all the three fingers of your left hand in mutually perpendicular direction to each other so that the four finger shows the direction of field which field magnetic field okay the central finger shows the direction of current it shows the direction of current so here when i say current it is the direction of positive charge it is the direction of positive charge similarly the thumb represents the direction of thrust so basically it is force so when you extend the three fingers mutually perpendicular to each other the four finger represents the direction of field central finger represents the direction of current so you can remember it like this four finger f f central finger c and c thumb th and th okay you can remember it like this okay now the question is when you take this four finger so when you are trying to find the direction don't extend or stretch all the three fingers simultaneously and keep rotating your hand go in an order so whenever you need to find the unknown there will be two known quantities suppose i take this example i know the direction of i know the direction of velocity and magnetic field so i'll go from the four finger so my four finger should be placed in the direction of field then what should i do extend the central finger when you extend the central finger it needs to be adjusted in such a way that it is in the direction of the current so current means what it should be in the direction of positive charge so charge is positive so i placed these two and extend the thumb that gives you the direction of magnetic field sorry that gives you the direction of magnetic force so in this case the direction of magnetic force is going to be into the plane and if you observe it is somewhat similar so when i do b cross b in this case so what is the direction of v vector it is j cap what is the direction of v vector it is i cap so what is going to be j cross i when i cross j is k cap j cross i will be minus k cap is that not what you are getting you are getting minus k cap but here i check the particles nature also it is positive so direction of v cross b is the same as the direction of force as well i hope you are able to understand that both the methods can be used to validate but see here i hope this point is also clear you understood when to use flemings left hand rule whichever is convenient for you you can go with it but this is all related to the concept of flemings left hand rule okay you can make a note of this Hmm, that depends on which direction the current is from
Shall I proceed? Sure. So, the next concept that we are going to see is motion of a charged particle in uniform magnetic field. Okay. So, till now, till now, whatever we discussed was applicable for whether it is uniform or non-uniform. But now we are going to specifically concentrate on understanding how the motion of a charged particle is going to be in the presence of uniform magnetic field. Okay. So, in which one point is again getting repeated. When the initial velocity of the particle is parallel to the magnetic field, what is going to happen? Theta is going to be 0 degree. And we know that F is equal to QVB sin of theta. It is going to be 0. Answer will be 0 itself. Right. From here, what can I conclude? That the particle is going to move in a straight line path with a uniform velocity. Okay, accepted. That is how it is going to work, right? Now, the next question is, what happens when the initial velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field? So, when the initial velocity is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, how is the charged particle going to move the question? See, when I take the velocity of the particle to be perpendicular and the charge to be Q, as so, if you observe the way I considered the magnetic field, unlike the previous scenarios where I considered set of parallel lines, here the magnetic field is considered into the plane. It is just for us to have a better visualization. But remember, this field is uniform. How am I able to conclude it is uniform? Look at the spacing. The spacing is same. Right? So if I say that the magnetic field is going to be B here, and the velocity of the particle is perpendicular to the magnetic field. As soon as it enters the magnetic field, what is going to be the force it is going to experience? Fb will be equal to Q into V into B sine of 90 degrees. Sine 90 is 1. So it is going to be QVB. And let me call this as equation number 1. So what is happening? As soon as the particle enters, its velocity is going to be like this, right? But an important observation from here is, we know that F vector is equal to Q into V vector cross V vector. Remember, whenever you're doing the cross product between two vectors, the resultant is always perpendicular to both the quantities for which we are doing the cross product. Meaning, force in this case is supposed to be perpendicular to both velocity and magnetic field. See, velocity is in this direction. Magnetic field is in this direction. So, let's find out the direction. Velocity is in x. Magnetic field is in z. Plus or minus z, I am not concerned about as of now. x and z. So, force should be in y direction. I don't know plus y or minus y. That we will find out. So, force will be perpendicular to both velocity and magnetic field, right? Now, having said that, observe, what is the case of velocity here? It is I cap cross. What is the direction of magnetic field? It is minus K cap. So, if I take the minus sign outside, I get I cap cross K cap. I cross K is going to be minus J. So, minus of minus J is going to be J cap. So, here the force experienced by the charged particle will be upward and it will be perpendicular to the velocity vector. Am I clear with this? Okay, this is a validation I did using the cross product, but let's use Fleming's left hand rule and see. So, here I am assuming that the charged particle is positive. Okay, listen. Now, I take my forefinger, place it in the direction of field, central finger in the direction of charged particle. Extend the thumb that is going to give me the direction of force. Clear with this? Forefinger, central finger, and thumb. It's giving me the answer. So, force is in the upward direction. But here, what is going to happen is velocity is like this, force is upwards. So, the particle will neither be able to completely follow the velocity's direction nor follow the direction in which it is experiencing a force. So, it will take a curved path. So, the particle is going to, is, will neither move along x direction nor 
y direction rather it will move in a curved path like this okay but i don't know what kind of a curved path it is we have not yet concluded so at this point if i take the direction of velocity it is going to be in this way so velocity is always tangential to the surface at that point okay now if i take the if i apply the fleming's left hand rule observe four finger into the plane central finger in this direction and thumb if you extend it it is going to be in this direction so force will be like this we know the fact that the force is always perpendicular to velocity in this case since the force is acting upward it is always going to act inward to the curve you are able to un understand it is going to be inward to the curve similarly due to this force and velocity again it will take a curved path so at this point what will happen again if you draw the velocity the force will be in this direction because they are supposed to be perpendicular to each other always so what is the important conclusion that we can draw the magnetic force is always perpendicular to whom perpendicular to velocity vector magnetic field magnetic force vector is always perpendicular to the velocity vector in which case in this case right so, so sorry uh, this is always going to happen i'm sorry correction here the magnetic force and the velocity are always perpendicular to each other and in this case obviously it is going to be applicable force and velocity are perpendicular but an important point to be noted is what can you conclude about the speed of the particle the speed of the particle is going to be constant why because according to newton's first law you can put an object into motion or you can bring an object which is in motion which is which is in uniform motion to rest only by applying force so if you observe the velocity is tangential force is perpendicular you can change the velocity of this particle only if you apply the force in the direction of its velocity but how is the force applied in this case it is always perpendicular to the surface okay since there is no force in the direction of in the direction of whom of b vector since there is no force in the direction of b vector what is that we can conclude speed of the particle is always a constant so what is that we can conclude from this force is always perpendicular to a constant velocity what is happening force is always perpendicular see force is always perpendicular to velocity is okay but force is always perpendicular to constant velocity in this scenario so when is force always perpendicular to constant velocity only when the object is in uniform circular motion so this is the only motion where you can say that the force and velocity are always perpendicular to each other and the speed of the particle is not changing so it is going to be uniform circular motion and tell me what is the force required for the particle to be in a circular motion which force puts the charge part which force puts the particle into circular motion it is the centripetal force so what is going to be the centripetal force of this particle centripetal force is going to be mv square divided by r so if i take this to be equation number 2 if you observe in the diagram itself the force is acting towards the center of the circular path hence i can conclude that the magnetic force qvb is the one which is providing the necessary centripetal force meaning meaning qvb is equal to mv square divided by r so who is providing the necessary centripetal force the magnetic force itself so magnetic force should be mathematically equal to the centripetal force so v and b will get cancelled which implies r is equal to mv divided by 
QB. And this is going to be the radius of the circular path in which the particle is going to revolve. So when will this radius get generated? When you throw the particle, when you project the particle perpendicular to the uniform magnetic field. When a charged particle is projected perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field, the path followed by the particle is circle and the radius of the circle is going to be mv divided by qb. But what is mv? mv is linear momentum. So linear momentum divided by qb. Can I write it like this? So we know that kinetic energy is equal to half mv square and momentum is equal to mv. On solving these two equations, we get kinetic energy is equal to p square divided by 2m. So from here, I can conclude that p is equal to root of 2m into k. So you can take this and substitute it here. So this can also be written as root of 2m into k, the whole divided by qb. Okay, it is root of 2m into k, the whole divided by qb. So depending on the parameter that is given in the problem, you can use either of the terms in the expression. So what will you use? mv by qb or p divided by qb or root of 2m into k divided by q into b. Am I clear with this? Right? Okay. So there is a small part. I'll finish that. Then you can copy. Okay, listen. Now we know that the charged particle is going to move in a circular path like this with the radius of r is equal to mv divided by qb and the velocity of the particle is going to be like this. Accept it. And we know that the radius and velocity are perpendicular to each other. This comes from the concept of circles, tangent and the normal. Tangent and radius are always perpendicular to each other. Right? Now, if I ask you what is the time taken by the particle to complete one revolution, what do you call it as? Time period. So what is going to be the time period of this particle? Time period is equal to one revolution by speed. So what is the distance covered in one revolution? It is going to be 2 pi r divided by what is going to be the speed of the particle? It is v only. So can I write this as 2 pi into, in the place of r, can I write it as mv divided by qb, the whole divided by v. v and v will get cancelled. What will be the answer? So t will be equal to 2 pi m divided by qb. So this is going to be the time period of the charged particle, which is the circular motion. Right now, I want you to concentrate. Listen to this carefully. If you observe, the radius of the particle is directly proportional to velocity. Means if I project a particle with a greater velocity, it is going to take a bigger turn, lesser velocity, a smaller turn. Right. But if you look at the time period, it is independent of velocity. So what is the meaning of this? Meaning, if you take the same charged particle, why I'm using the word same charged particle is because I want m, q to be the same. I want the charge and the mass of the particle to be the same. Okay. So if you take the same charged particle, project whatever velocity you want into the same magnetic field B, Right, with which what will happen is the radius of the path will change, but the time period will be the same. That is the meaning of this word independent of V. So what is going to happen is observe if I project this if I project a particle with greater speed, it will take a bigger radius. Let's say it is taking two seconds to complete one revolution. Right? If you project the same particle with lesser radius. It will take a smaller turn, but it will take the same two seconds to come. Means with the speed, it will adjust its radius so that it is able to generate the same time period. That is the meaning of independent of velocity. Am I clear with that point? Right. So that's what happens here. Now, if I take the reciprocal of this, what is going to happen? If I take the frequency, frequency is the 
reciprocal of time period so this is going to be equal to qb divided by 2 pi m if you observe frequency is also obviously independent of velocity and this frequency is given a name called as cyclotron frequency cyclotron is basically a device which is used to accelerate charged particles which is used to accelerate charged particles so this frequency of qb divided by 2 pi m is what is called as cyclotron frequency and this is all about a charged particle projected perpendicular to uniform magnetic field and this is a very 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 important concept so whenever a charged particle in uniform magnetic field is discussed most of the questions are based out of this concept only that is why it's just on so many points and explained it i hope you could understand how r is related to mb linear momentum and kinetic energy similarly what is the meaning of independence of time sorry independence of velocity here you can make a note of this hello keep on doing your R itself is generated because of heat, and heat is not generated because of power. Radius is controlled by the speed. Speed is not controlled by the radius. And if you look at velocity, you see that radius is not. Another is that when R is equal to mv, we can get R is dependent on heat. Heat is not dependent on R. Next level. Can you just like?
Good. Sir, online any questions? Uh, no, sir. Okay, we'll wind up this. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah.